Oh hi, I'm the heretic. Now before you ask, this is not a drama video. Let's just get to it. So when I was becoming a voluntarist, before I started this channel, I was chatting on a debate message board and someone asked a question, and this was directed to everyone. If there was one thing, one thing, you wanted people you disagree with to understand, what would it be? A fellow voluntarist said it best, the state is not capitalism. The actions of a state do not equate to actions that a capitalist society would undertake, and in fact the state is an impediment to capitalism. After all, capitalism requires property rights, which a state necessarily violates in order to exist. It's called taxation, and if a state cannot tax, then it cannot support itself, as nobody would voluntarily associate with a coercive monopoly. So the state's actions can never be capitalistic. Now I know, I know, the state doesn't necessarily mean socialism or communism either. I got it. All capitalism is, is the voluntary exchange of property. So, why am I talking about this? Because Democratic Socialist 01 is going to school us on the horror of capitalism's true death count. Even before watching this video, I know he's going to blame capitalism for all the things states do, particularly in countries where the state pays lip service to property rights all in a transparent attempt to hide the whole murdered tens of millions during peacetime argument against Marxism. But who knows? I've been surprised before. Hit it! You all would have noticed that the proponents of capitalism like to claim that communist regimes in the 20th century murdered around 100 million people. They make this claim repeatedly because they think it gives them moral superiority and a justifiable reason to dismiss Marxist ideas. You reduce the infinitely complex network of human relations to that of uh, arbitrary categories of oppressor and oppressed. Then you teach them to hate their oppressors. Hatred is simply the not caring of what happens to something. So don't be surprised when the implementation of your ideas results in massacres on a national scale. And usually when that happens, it's how we know that your ideas suck. In fact, criticism even came from the contributing authors of the book, such as Nicholas Wirth and John Lewis McGolan, who publicly distanced themselves from the 100 million death count figure. Wirth and McGolan even accused the primary author of the Black Book, Stéphane Courtois, of being obsessed with arriving at the total of 100 million killed. So far you've cited zero evidence that the 100 million number is disputable, only that some of the authors are doing what you're doing right now and making an equivalency argument for the death toll of capitalism, or otherwise disagree with the main author for vague and unspecified reasons. So those who cite the 100 million figure are simply taking advantage of poor and sloppy scholarship. Prove it. Now even if the Black Book's dubious figure was true, this wouldn't give right-wing pundits the moral superiority they so desperately crave. The reason for this is that the death toll of capitalism, the economic system they love and support, would have beaten communism's alleged death count many times over. This is where the fun begins. Now before we discuss the deaths caused by capitalism, we must define what capitalism is. That's great. I gave my definition earlier, so it's good you're defining your terms. Please continue. Capitalism is an economic system that is based on the private ownership of the means of production and their operation for profit. It is characterized by wage labor or forced labor if they can get away with it, producing for the purposes of selling, aka commodity production, and of course, capital accumulation. Oh great. You know you're in for a good time when we can't even agree on what words mean. We're hopping down a rabbit hole since now he has to define what profit means. For the record, Profit is revenue minus expense greater than zero. I'm sure his definition of profit is different, though. This whole thing about redefining words is meant to confuse people who aren't clear on what the definition of these words are. The problem with Demsock's definition of capitalism is that it's self-contradicting. Workers' co-ops, for example, would have to be banned since they aren't privately owned. Similarly, it demands that there can only be wage labor or forced labor which means internships would have to be banned too. And these things could only be made illegal through a coercive monopoly. This means private property rights can't exist. And we've already established that private property rights can't truly exist under statism. If a state is not taxing people and violating their rights, it's not a state. To quickly summarize, 
The Marxist straw man definition of capitalism is a system that protects property rights by violating property rights. At least my definition is consistent. And because consistency is preferable to inconsistency, my definition is better. The capitalists themselves are those who own the means of production. What are the means of production? The industries that produce goods that the capitalist tries to sell on the market for the best price he can get. As for the workers, they must accept the conditions set by the capitalist or go hungry. This gives the capitalist great control over the workforce. How many times do I need to repeat that that's not how the employer-employee relationship works? The workers want to work for as much of a wage as possible. And without workers, production is impossible. Good employees who are very productive can negotiate for higher wages. After all, if their demands aren't met, they can go work for another capitalist who will pay them these wages. Do employers want to pay employees as little as possible? Yes, absolutely. But the workers and employers have to meet somewhere in the middle to achieve an agreement both can consent to. The Marxist perspective argues that the employer-employee relationship is inherently parasitical. Of course it looks parasitical, you're only looking at one half of the relationship. Now how about, instead of inserting yourself as a third party into a mutually beneficial relationship, we leave people alone? Sound good? No? Why not? Now whilst one could argue that people acting in their self-interest could create incentives and promote innovation, it is hard to deny that this mindset has also caused the death of millions in both the 19th and 20th centuries. So far you haven't given any examples. We're only one quarter into the video, so... So how should we calculate the death toll of capitalism? Well, it is clear that we will never have an exact number, but we can certainly say that it runs well into the hundreds of millions. Come on, quit teasing me! German academic Thomas Pogge estimates that in the 15 years after the Cold War, 270 million, 18 million a year, perished due to terrible poverty. This includes those who have died from poor sanitation, starvation, and a lack of medical care. 270 million died because of the conditions of poverty, which has nothing to do with capitalism. People have been impoverished since the beginning of humanity, and in fact the spread of capitalism has actually reduced poverty. The equivalency fallacy is at play here. Communism and socialism caused the deaths of hundreds of millions as a matter of policy. Stalin's purges, the Holodomor, the Great Leap Forward. These deaths that capitalism is supposedly guilty of are a result of not having legitimately earned wealth confiscated and redistributed from the point of a gun, which is a ridiculous standard for determining guilt. Don't get me wrong, their deaths are tragic, but blaming capitalism for their deaths is like charging someone for murder for failing to prevent one. Now why is that the fault of capitalism? It isn't. Furthermore, modern industry controlled by capitalists produce more than enough food and other essential goods to completely end world hunger and poverty. Yet this does not happen. Why? Because under capitalism, the world's impoverished citizens are not seen as people who need desperate help, but rather as unpaying customers who cannot afford goods and services. See? I was just talking about this. Good lord, these people are predictable. Want to know how to solve hunger? You don't collectivize farms. They tried that in Maoist China and it sucked. You know what else you don't do? Have a coercive monopoly artificially inflate the price of food by confiscating millions of tons of food and just leaving it to rot. Do you have any idea how many hungry people could have been fed with it? A lot. After all, it is in the capitalist's self-interest to derive profits from their assets, using their great economic power to help the desperately poor would be completely unprofitable. Economic firms do a lot to help the poor. Not only because it's great PR, but capitalism necessarily makes goods and services cheaper and thus more affordable to more people. When plasma TVs first came out, they cost tens of thousands of dollars. Now you can get a very high quality flat screen for hundreds. This obsession with profits is actually pretty worrying. Anyone who watches a communist video is strongly advised to not play a drinking game where you take a shot every time they say profit. Seriously, don't do that. 
For example, during the Irish potato famine of the 1840s and 50s, British landlords continued to export food for profit rather than feed the starving Irish. Now why would they do this? because exporting food was far more profitable than helping penniless Irish peasants and workers, after all. The potato famine was a result of crippling protectionism exacerbated by public works programs that required high taxes to pay for and crowded out private charities that blunted any damage famines have done in the past. It's worth noting that the British government also turned away a grain ship from Massachusetts and had the Sultan of Turkey reduce his charitable donation to not embarrass Queen Victoria. So what made the potato famine so bad? Statism. It's always frickin' statism. Now as I said, in the Imperial Age, this economic behavior by capitalists was pretty typical. Capitalists who were backed by colonial governments would use the indigenous people of the conquered territories as a source of cheap labor. Nowhere in that statement does a voluntary transaction occur. You can blame a lot of things for what happened here, but capitalism is not one of them. To give another example, in the man-made famines of British India, more than enough food was being produced to feed the Indian population. However, both the landlords and the British government preferred to sell these goods on the world market, where they would receive a much greater profit. Another example of why statism sucks. Still, nothing to do with capitalism unless you argue the British government owned the land legitimately. I'm just going to keep repeating myself at this point, aren't I? It is impossible to ignore the Congo Free State, which was not controlled by the Belgium government, but by a single capitalist, Leopold II. In that nation, the entire population was put to work extracting rubber and ivory for the benefit of one man. Funny you omit how this guy was a king, a literal head of state, who declared the Congo his property. His wealth and assets come from taxpayers, so he owns the Congo in the same way a mugger owns your wallet. He doesn't, and to call it an example of capitalism is absolutely ridiculous. Now, my critics would suggest that I am simply attributing the deaths caused by colonialism to capitalism. Well, according to Cecil Rhodes, a capitalist and imperialist, one of the motivations of imperial conquest was about securing new markets. That doesn't disprove anything. It suggests benevolence on the part of the colonizers to uplift primitive societies to the lifestyles of modernity. Obviously, that didn't happen. Huh. The state attempting to help, but only managing to hurt people. Imagine my shock. Now I'm going to jump forward. If I replied to everything Demsako 1 says, I'd be repeating myself a lot. Basically, he cites some British officials saying that imperialism was good because potatoes. Demsok then goes into the opium wars between the British Empire and China, an excellent example of statism seeking easy money. So the evidence is pretty conclusive about capitalism's very close relationship with murderous and exploitive imperialism in the 19th century. All you said was that imperialism sucks, and governments conquering lands for fun and profit generally makes things worse. I mean, we're on the same page on that. The government sucks at building bridges, protecting schools, drug wars, enforcing laws, enforcing laws fairly, building websites, and you expect them to somehow become super competence mcskilled at uplifting the less developed world? Of course not. None of this is capitalism's fault. Honestly, I could just replace all your instances of the word capitalism with statism, and your, your video would actually be pretty accurate. It is the system that is the problem. The capitalists must stay in business, and one of the ways to do so is to find the cheapest labor source possible, and to sell their commodities at the best price they possibly can. They must have an edge over their competitors or be forced out of the market. The system forces people to act unethically. There's far more to business than just labor. This is a recurring problem whenever I see communists talk about business, and to be honest, it's getting repetitive. There's rent on the property. There's utilities, insurance, liability, inventory. Depending on your business, you might have marketing expenses, banking and credit fees, accounting, legal, logistics, including shipping. All of this before we get into taxation and regulatory compliance. Running a business is navigating an intricate web of priorities and interests, and employees are spared from having to worry about any of it. It's called division of labor and specialization. For example, 
It wouldn't take a genius to figure out who would win between a capitalist who decided to feed the world's starving citizens or a capitalist who sold his goods at high prices to wealthy customers. If that were true, then there'd be no market for BMWs or any other affordable cars, and the only cars we'd see on the road are Italian sports cars. To use your food example, if what you're saying is true, then the only thing we'd have for sale in supermarkets is caviar and truffles. Fortunately, what you say isn't true, and a business that can market goods so cheap that large numbers of poor people can buy it will make a killing. If you don't believe me, just look at Henry Ford. Therefore, a system based on the pursuit of profit and private wealth accumulation cannot be ethical. In fact, it leads to a world where eight people have as much wealth as 50% of the world's population. Ethics are what happens when you apply the first principles of logic to interpersonal relations and use them to determine right from wrong. Given that the same principles from which we derive the scientific method apply to ethics, we can conclude that ethics are objective, because logic is objective. So are you going to explain how having too much wealth means these uber-rich are violating the consistency principle? No? Then you're wrong. Having huge amounts of money, provided it wasn't stolen from elsewhere, is not unethical. The only way it could be is if them spending money meant someone else didn't. Which can't be true because, because otherwise economic growth would be impossible. So, it should not surprise people that this system has killed hundreds of millions of people throughout its long history. It is undemocratic, exploitative, and murderous. Wait, oh, oh yeah, I, I forgot this video was about how capitalism has a death toll. Yeah, it's easy to forget that when you spend 80% of the video in a rant about imperialism. Nowhere in this video is it clear how the exchange of private property results in the death of millions. Your strongest claim is that there are hundreds of millions of people who starve to death when the food that could have fed them did exist. The problem is that you're assuming guilt through absence, and if foreign aid is anything to go by, simply giving them food harms local farmers who can't compete with free, and makes populations dependent on charitable food, and otherwise unable to provide for themselves. That's what true cruelty is. Give a man a fish he can eat for a day. Teach a man to fish, and he will eat for the rest of his life. If you really care about the poor or hungry, then we need to get rid of the state. The same state that artificially increases produce prices. The same state that starved tens of millions of Indians to death. The same state that brutally tortured and killed millions of Congoese. The same state whose rampant corruption and overregulation of their economies has stunted any chance of their respective nations from ever reaching their full developmental potential. Want to solve world hunger? Private property rights. Not the pseudo-property of conquered lands that characterize colonial states who just gave that land to cronies. Actual, legitimate parcels of land purchased in exchange between consenting adults and farming entrepreneurs selling food and making a profit so that they can invest in their farm and produce more food. Profit being defined as revenue minus expense being greater than zero. Hunger in the world is a real problem. But if we're serious about solving it, the last people we want responsible for feeding them is the one who starved them to death in the first place. As for the claim that imperialism is capitalist, therefore capitalism is responsible for imperialism's atrocities, no. That's dumb. Questions? Comments? Critique? What's the one thing you want people who disagree with you to understand? And if you're answering that question, say your ideology as well. Please support me through my Ko-Fi and Patreon pages. Like, share, and subscribe to become a heretic today.